that there are so many obstacles and enemies in life, and life comes at you in such difficult ways, hard ways, un, you know, intimidating ways um, that only by faith can you say it is well with my soul because uh, God gives you that advantage, and that's really a, one of the things uh, that God does is in, in our life as Christians that give us an opportunity to to conquer, to exceed, to move to what God's called us to, to fulfill our assignment and our mission with God. How many of you believe that God has given you an assignment? Yeah, yeah you, you believe this, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a pastor or it doesn't mean that you're going to be a worship leader, maybe a Sunday school teacher or a prayer leader. It, it just means that God has created you for something and that he has equipped you and prepared you and that uh, he, ha he is working in you and his Holy Spirit has anointed you by inhabiting you when you trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit, God himself, came and, 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 and came inside your body. I mean, you are a walking miracle of God right now because of everything that God has done to give us an advantage in, in, and an edge in this life. And we've been looking at this in the life of King David, uh, many people's favorite Bible character. Uh, yeah. But we haven't been looking at his whole life. We've just been really looking at the part in the lead up and in the battle with Goliath. It's uh, only two chapters in 1 Samuel 16 and 17. But uh, God has really worked in us and uh, I think just had some tremendous word uh, and, and, and knowledge and, and gifts that God has give us, given us and pearls out of, his, out of these little passages of Scripture because, you know, uh, when God records his word, he's not just recording things like David and Goliath so that we can have an exciting Bible story, so that somehow everybody will know historically what happened with the Philistines and the Israelites. God places these, these dramas in his word so that they can speak to us, yeah, yeah. so that we can see something about these things that we're going to need that help us. God doesn't waste his word, you know. If he's in the word, it has a purpose. If it's there, God wants us to know. It has a reason why God wants us to know. And so as we look at the word of God, it strengthens us, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yeah, we say that quite often, but that is absolutely the truth that God's Word gives us, builds our faith, and our faith gives our hope something to stand on. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if faith needs something to stand on, like I'm standing on this stage, if hope needs something to stand on, it's faith. That's faith that it stands on. And, and you get your faith built by the word of God when you see things like David and, the, and Goliath, when you see things like Jesus talking to his disciples and stilling the waves and calming the seas and raising from the dead. This gives our faith strength so that our hope can stand and you can have an advantage. And we've been looking at this is actually the fifth message and uh, the final one really on this particular section here and, and what we're seeing. And I've been talking to you about an edge and we started out by looking at the fact that God has anointed us like he anointed King David as a child and sent him back out in the field. And God anoints us with his Holy Spirit. God comes inside of us and, and, and gives us uh, gifts and abilities and, 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 and spirit and heart and awareness in life. But then uh, as those go on, those gifts and those abilities and those anointings from God should come with a little label that says uh, some assembly required because they're not just automatic, right? We have to work on these things. It's our responsibility to grow the gift that God has deposited in, us, deposited in us. Just as David was sent back out into the fields after Samuel anointed him so that he could learn how to tend sheep like a king. And God could teach him some lessons in the field that he would need when he got in the palace. And that God could prepare him and give him some experiences that were going to actually propel him to the palace. 
So we have a responsibility. It's not just that God gives us something and then we have no responsibility to this. It's our respons responsibility to be diligent, to be disciplined, to, to work with these. How many miles did David drag that harp through that desert playing for the sheep to get good enough that when the king needed somebody to play a harp, he was the first thought? Yeah. My goodness, man, how many lessons did that take? How much discipline did that take? How much diligence? It wasn't a harmonica he put in his back pocket. He had to drag it around, carry it around, tune it up, get its strings, fix the things, practice it, do it. I mean, for years, it, diligent in there. So God anoints us, gives us gifts. Then we work those gifts. We, we, we use those gifts. We practice those gifts. And God increases our ability. And then the one thing that really pushes us past commonality is our, is our attitude. It's our attitude that matters when it comes to moving with the things of God. Are we passionate about the things of God? Or is it ho-hum, blah, blah? I mean, yeah, oh well. Uh, whole army full of Israelites. Whole army full of God's people. I'll just remind you that God had anointed and blessed all of his people. The whole army of Israel was blessed. Any one of the army guy, any one of the soldiers could have walked out and, and, and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? But there was only one that had enough passion for the things of God and the kingdom of God and the, and the call of God on the nation of Israel. He was passionate enough about it to say, are we going to let this guy sit here and insult the kingdom of God? Who does this guy think he is? So our passion, our, our attitude gives us an edge. Mm -hmm. And then we learn how to approach the enemy because David approached the enemy in a very specific way. He didn't run down there and go hand to hand with this giant of a man. No, he went to a certain point and stopped which we have to work on our point to stop now. You know, all of us need some battle lines. The Bible said he ran to the battle line and he stopped and he began to sling, swing his sling, and then he let that rock fly. David was a slinger. And, and that meant he fought long distance. He fought through the air. We learned that we fight through the air uh, our prayers, uh, the Philippians passage that was up here uh, before, uh, be anxious for no thing. Be anxious for nothing is the old King James way of saying that. And I, I like to say, be anxious for no thing. Don't worry about something. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made, made known to God. And then the peace of God which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so God has given us weaponry to fight that with, and, 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 it, and, it, and it, is, it is airborne, and by that I mean spirit-borne weapons that we use. And so we're to keep our distance and we're to use the weaponry that God has given us. And when we do that, God will give us the advantage. We don't get all tangled up in our feelings. We don't get, we don't, we, we don't, we don't get all tangled up in what others say. Uh, we don't let the devil drag us into his drama because he will. He loves drama. Yeah, yeah. And he'll drag you in it upside down and backward in every way and you'll forget everything you ever knew about God or hoped for life. Yeah. And he'll distract you if he can. And then today, now today, the last word from, from this passage is about our advantage. Uh, we're going to learn a phrase today, uh, and, and I hope you can get with me on this. But the phrase is the, is the title of the message. It's the outline 
on your outline, it's at the top, and you see it here on the screen, and the phrase is, act as if. Mm -hmm. Can you say that with me? Act as if. This gives us an advantage because act as if is a message about how to look at life's challenges. How I look at life's challenges either gives me the advantage or puts me at a disadvantage. David's advantage is not so much about skill as it is about the spirit. David was not given an advantage so much out of the techniques he used, but out of the fact that he trusted God. So let's let, let's let this analogy come alive for us for a moment. I mean, the giant that, that David faced is the same giant that we face. It's an analogy for, for the life that comes at us every day. Every day we have a giant of a life that comes at us. Life can be intimidating. Life can be insulting. Life can be accusing. Life can be belittling. And, and, and so Goliath comes like this intimidating giant life that comes at you every day. And as our uh, resident uh, theologian that we love so much, Rocky Balboa says, uh, nothing hits harder than life. And in this verse, David tells us that 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 the, the, the enemy is going to come for you. Uh, verse 45, I, I meant to put it on the screen for you, I'm sorry. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the armies of Israel, whom you defy. David is saying, look, here, here, here's, here, this enemy is going to come at you. Whether you love Jesus or not. Whether you serve Jesus or not. Whether you come to church or don't come to church, life is going to come at you and intimidate you and crush you and scare you. And, and the longer I walk with the Lord, the less surprised I am by that. Mm -hmm. Because when I first got saved, I was 16 years old. A long time ago. And I thought pretty sure I knew what life was going to be like when I came to the Lord when I was 16. I thought, well, by, I looked at the older people in the church, the 20-year-olds, and I said, by the time I get 20, I know I'm going to have this Christian life all figured out. And this sin problem that I have as a 16-year-old is not going to still be with me. I will have conquered this because I'm a child of God. And I said that until I turned 20. And when I turned 20... I, I looked at the, the real older people in the church, the 25-year-olds and 26-year-olds that, for heaven's sakes, had children. And I said, man, I know by the time I get to be their age, I'll have this thing all figured out, and, and it's going to be easy peasy, and down the hill we go. And, and, and I said that until I got to be 25 or 26. And then it became 35, and then 40, and now... And then after about 40, I just stopped saying that all together, you know. Because life doesn't get easier. It, it seems that as a Christian, as a child of God, that life would get easier. But the fact is that life doesn't get easier even for children of God because back then we were chasing pimples as far as our problems go. And now we're looking at tumors as far as our problems will go. And there's a, there's a whole lot of difference, right? Yeah, yeah. And the pain and the suffering and the sickness and the hospitals and the illness and the bills and the jobs and the grandchildren and the surgeries and the kids, all of this comes against you. Whether you like it or not, that giant stands before you and laughs every day. Maybe that's why Jesus said, in, Matt, in John 16, uh, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Yeah, that's right. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Yeah, yeah. So don't get all bent out of shape, because this is what life's going ha to hand you, and, and don't worry about it, I've got it. So I have a question uh, today and an announcement. The question is, at this point in your life, at this stage in your life, 
what is coming at you. At this stage in your life, what is coming at you? And here's the announcement, whatever it is, if you are a child of God, you have the advantage. Let me say that again. Whatever it is, as a child of God, God has built our lives and our relationships so that, that he can work in us to our advantage, no matter what it is. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. The amazing thing about that statement is that any of the Israelites could have said that. All of the Israelite nation was blessed by God. Israel was blessed by God. The Abrahamic covenant said, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you and many other things. So any of the Israelites could have said the same thing David said. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, whose name and armies you have defiled. Anybody? Could. Sure, there were other slingers in the army, you, don't you think? Surely David wasn't the only slinger. Man, he wasn't even in the army. He was out in the field with some sheep. He's a little old boy, according to what the Scripture described him as. And, and yet, and, and, and there were many others that were probably uh, more experienced than him. Uh, many others that were certainly bigger than him. And, and, and many others that were most likely better trained than him. But David was the only one who saw the advantage. All of the other guys looked out there and saw a tremendous big enemy. David looked out there and said, man, this is the, most, this is the biggest opportunity that I have ever seen in my life. So David didn't have a better advantage. David just had an awareness of the advantage that he had. Now, I don't want that to sound like double talk. I, I, look, you don't need a better advantage. God has given you all of the advantage you need against an enemy, no matter what enemy it is. What you need and I need is we need a greater awareness of the advantage that we already have. I mean, I mean think about it. Think about it. Everybody that belongs to Christ is filled, he says, with a, with a Holy Spirit that is his spirit, and it's put on the inside of us. And so if you have been saved, you have the same Holy Spirit in you that Jesus had. You have the same Holy Spirit that Peter and Paul and Mary, <laughs> the real ones, not the band, and, and, and James and John and, 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 uh, and, and Dwight Moody and Billy Sunday and Billy Graham. And I mean, I mean, you have the same Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Look at what he says in Romans 8. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You're talking about an advantage. That, that verse said that Jesus and death walk into a ring together to fight it out. And when the fight is over, Jesus Christ alone walks out of the ring and death lays down in the middle of the ring and dies. David viewed this thing differently than others. That's all. I mean, the others looked at it and said, man, that guy's too big to kill. And David looked at him and said, man, that guy's too big to miss. What are you talking about? David's advantage was the way he looked at it. And I'm saying to you that God gives us an advantage by teaching us how to look at things in a different way. Everybody in the army saw the same obstacle. And all of them said, this is an impossible obstacle. And David looked at the same obstacle and said, this is a this is a, 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 a tremendous opportunity, I mean, a, a, an impossible opportunity, a tremendous opportunity. This thing, he just looked at it in a different way. And so 
God wants to teach us this, and I think this passage. Look, verse 45, David said to the Philistines, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, and I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Look at what he says to them. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. This little old shepherd boy picking up rocks, putting them in a sling. This day, look how big he's talking. Look at, look at him, look at him. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I'll strike you down, and I'll cut off your head. This very day I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army. Now he's out there not only whipping Goliath, he's going to whip the whole army. He said, I'll just take all of you on, and I'm going to feed the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. David said, you know why I'm doing this? So that the whole world will know. Those people are watching. Those people are looking and they need to see that God can do anything. And I want the whole world to know there's a God in Israel. And then he goes on and says, all those gathered here will know that it's not by sword. It, 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 hey, it's not by, by my strength. It's not by my technique. It's by God's spirit and my surrender and my trust. That's how this battle's being won. You'll know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. So truth number one becomes this for us. Opposition doesn't prevent the presence of God. Just because you are opposed by an enemy it doesn't mean that God's not going to show up. Opposition doesn't prevent the presence of God. It offers an opportunity to prove God's presence in your life. The fact that you have problems and the fact that you have issues going on in your life doesn't mean that God is not with you and he's far away from you. As a matter of fact, it means just the opposite. It means God has thrown something into your life that challenges you so you can learn how to overcome. Listen, if you don't ever have any conflicts, how are you going to ever overcome anything? And he says we're to be overcomers in life. So, man, we got to have some things to practice. So some things have to come against us. And it's, it's not how life comes at you, but, but, but how you view life's issues that gives you the advantage. David was not stronger than anybody else. He was not smarter than anybody else. He was not more gifted than all of the others. He just saw the situation differently from them. And because he saw the situation differently from them, it gave him the advantage. So the question then for us becomes, how do I get the ability to see my advantage? What would God do for me sitting here in 2019 to help me get to see my advantage? Because if all it was was that he saw it differently because he already had an advantage because of God and the God that indwelt him and inhabited it, and you have the same spirit he had and everybody else has had from that point forward. And the reason he was able to accomplish that great thing was because he looked at it differently, and, God, and he saw the advantage God had already given him. How do I get that? How do I learn how to look at things like that? And there comes our phrase, act as if. First thing, act as if. Now, some people might say, uh, fake it till you make it. Uh, but I don't like to use the word fake in connection with faith. So I like a better phrase for it would be, would be all right, let's, let's act as if. Now we've all, you, and I, I know because I've taught you and I know you remember everything I say, but <laughs> this is, I know this is redundant for most folks. But you know, I've talked to you about um, believing your way to better actions. In other words, we, we've, we're all pretty common, uh, we pretty commonly know that if we want to change our behavior, we have to change what we believe. Because we behave the way we behave because we believe what we believe. So if you want to change the way you're acting, change the way you're believing, and your actions will change. Now, I'm going to say right now the exact opposite of that. Not that that's not true, it's absolutely true, but so is the opposite of that in that you can act 
your way to new beliefs. Now, I know you're looking at me like a calf at a new gate, and you're not really thinking that I'm, to, you know, I'm going anywhere with this. You said, Pastor, now you've fallen off the wagon now here, all right? But just, well, just hang on. Let's see if we can drag it back up, all right? I'm saying to you that act as if is part of what you have to learn to do if you are going to be able to see the advantage that you have. Because there are going to be all kinds of things that happen in your life and giants that come and horrible situations and terrible things and overwhelming times that come in your life that you're not going to want to, to look at as if somehow you have an advantage. You're going to be intimidated and afraid and, and frightened. I mean, look, if you have a giant coming in your life and you're a little timid and you're, you know, a little bashful about this thing, act as if you're brave and you will become braver. Don't you, look, don't you think that that little shepherd hand of David's, when it was reaching into that bag to get that rock out, don't you think that little hand was trembling? Don't you think that when he pulled that rock out of that bag and he had that sling in his hand, don't you think if you could listen real good and you could hear what was going on and he's sitting here, he's talking all big, you know, he's saying, I'm going to feed you to the, to the, to the birds and the wild animals and I'm going to uh, spread your carcasses all over the road out there, dead. I'm going to defeat everything. And, and his little voice is quivering and his little rock is shaking as he's trying to put that rock in that sling. But the truth is, if you can learn to load a sling and you can learn to, uh, 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 to, to, to uh, uh, get a rock out of, a, uh, out of your pouch and, and, and prepare yourself while your hands are shaking and your palms are, are sweating, you can call it fake it until you make it, bluff until you believe, uh, act as if. I mean, you can call it anything you want. And this is not, I'm not talking about third wave theology and, uh, and word of faith stuff where they tell you to speak and you can just speak everything into existence. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this is you talking to yourself and speaking the advantage that God has given you like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Huh? What about that one? Or cast all your cares on me for I care for you. Or I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We have all kinds of advantages that God promises us in his word. And if while we're shaking and, you know, and, and we're timid and we're a little bit bashful, if we can learn how to carry on eventually, and listen, eventually, it's not going to happen the first time, eventually, maybe not the second time, but eventually we will be begin to become aware of the advantage that God has given us, and that's what walking by faith is. I mean, we say that, you got to walk by faith, brother. Well, what does that mean? That means that in spite of that giant standing out there and my hand shaking, I can barely get a rock in it, that I'm going to be saying to myself, God is with me. He's not going to forsake me. He's not going to forget me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I'm still loading while I'm shimmering, and I'm still carrying on while I'm frightened on the inside, but I'm acting as if I'm brave, and that if I believe this, and I'm going to carry on through with this thing, and God is going to anoint me, and I'm going to learn eventually that what I'm saying on the inside is absolutely true, that I do have the advantage, and God is with me in spite of how it looks, and that is walking by faith. And so I remember a turning point in my life. You might be shocked by this, but there was a time in my life as a preacher that I was very timid and shy. What am I saying? Mm. You, she loved me. She probably didn't think so. Man, I was. I'm serious. I started when I was 18. And I, I, didn't, I got saved when I was 16. I had two years. And I went to a church, a little country church in Meridian. My pastor was a great man, loved the Lord, wonderful pastor. But he was not demonstrative or, or very bold. You know, I mean, he preached good messages and, and all of that, but he just wasn't, you know, uh, very uh, illustrative and, 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 and forward, you know. And so when I started, I didn't know how to be a preacher. So I, all I knew is to try to imitate what he did. 
you know, how do you become a preacher? Well, you know, the ones you see that you say, well, I need to do it like that. And so now I'm 22 years old. We're out in the middle. We're in a revival. Tanya and I are working with music and youth in a church in Meridian. And, and I'm, like I said, I'm 22. And, and, and we were asked to be in a revival meeting with our pastor. He was going to be preaching. And they wanted Tanya and I to lead the music in this revival meeting. And this revival meeting was in this little country church in Kemper County, uh, Mississippi, in the middle of a cornfield. I'm telling you, it had probably 50 acres of corn on every side of that church building. And it was like a little postage stamp cut out in the middle of that gigantic cornfield. And they didn't have any air conditioning, and they had to open the windows at night, and horse flies flew in that place, man, all over the place. I was singing back then. There was a song called I'll Rise Again. Maybe some of you might remember it, Dallas Home. And I, I got to the part of it and said, I, and I'll rise. And the horse fly went, ah. Right on my teeth. I mean, it was terrible. And about Wednesday night, about Wednesday night, my, our pastor got sick. He had gout. And it got on him so bad that he couldn't stand up. So he couldn't preach. So that the, the host pastor asked me, Keith, could you take over for him and preach the message tonight? And I said, I said, sure I can. I said, oh yeah, I'll be glad to. I looked like David talking to the giant. I'm going to kill you. I mean, I was brave and full of confidence on the inside. I'm going, sure I can. And I remember at that night we got to that church and Tanya and I got all the music ready and the little choir ready and all that kind of stuff and everything ready for the music. And then I, I had just a few minutes before church started and I went in a little hall. And they had a little tiny educational building in the back of that sanctuary and it had a little small Sunday school rooms. And I went in one of those Sunday school rooms. I didn't even turn the light on. It was black dark in there. And I got out on my knees and I said, God, I said, I don't know what we got to do here. But uh, I need you, and, and, and I'm tired of being uh, timid. I'm tired of being bashful. I'm tired of not being able to express myself and being self-conscious about how people feel about me, look about me, think about me. God, I, I, I want to just, I, I want to be bold tonight. God, I'm going to be bold. I, when I go out there, I'm going to be bold in the Word, and I'm going to preach the Word with boldness. And it was like God just patted me back and said, well, I wonder when it was going to come, you know. And man, I went out there, and I'm telling you, I preached that night. I didn't even recognize myself. I mean, it was unbelievable. But you know what? That was in me all the time. I, all I needed to do was let it go. All I needed to know was that God had anointed me to do this, and all, and all you got to do is in your son, just let it go. Just, uh, just see it in you and say, I'm going to just do it and be bold and let it out of me. And I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you that when opposition comes in your life, that is an opportunity for God to prove his presence in your life. Now, it might, be, it, it might be some row up with the family. It might be some uh, failure financially. It might be can't get a job. It might be uh, no money in the coffers. It might, I don't know what it is. We could be anything. But when that opposition comes, that is an opportunity for God to prove himself mighty in your behalf. And opposition does not prevent the presence of God. It offers an opportunity for the presence of God to be proven in our life, which leads us to truth number two. There are five of these, by the way, if you don't have your notes. I may not get to them, but I'm going to try to. Truth number two, an unrecognized advantage is an unclaimed reward. Now, when we're talking about looking at things differently and we're talking about the advantage that God gives us, I'm saying to you that if you do not recognize the advantage that God has in you, you are going to miss the reward. There is a reward out there, and you're going to miss it because you don't even see it. You remember last week, 
uh, or it may have been the week before we were at about verse 20, 25 of chapter 17. And you remember David went down there to the battlefield and he heard Goliath talking and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And when he said that, the soldiers got around him and said, hey, David, you know, have you heard what Saul said he's going to do for the guy that kills this guy? He's going to, man, not only is he going to be a champion for God, but he's going to give him lots of money and he's going to give him his daughter to, to, as his wife, and, and his family's not going to have to pay any more taxes the rest of their life. Cool deal, right? Cool deal. Any of those guys, are you hearing me? Any of those guys that were telling David about the deal could have stopped and, 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 and stepped forward that day, but because they didn't see the advantage, they didn't get the reward. So the, the reward remained unclaimed as long as you, could, as long as you can't see the advantage. Uh, there, I've heard a story all my life in, in the ministry. I don't know if it's true or not, and I'm not investigating it because it's too good of an illustration, and I don't care whether it's true or not. But here's, here's the story. Here's the story. There was a freshman in college that went to a, a Christian college, and he got to campus, and about halfway through the semester, he was just starving to death. He hadn't gone to the cafeteria, hadn't eaten any meals in the cafeteria. All the other students had, were sitting down to three meals in the cafeteria, seemed to be doing fine. And he, di he, he didn't because he didn't have any money. And so he went into the campus ministry office and he said to the campus pastor, uh, Pastor, do you think that, the, that, that, that you could help me with some money? I need a little financial aid. I need a little benevolence. Because I, I hadn't had, I mean, I've just been eking by, I've just been scratching by, and I'm so hungry, and I can't, I don't have enough money to buy my food in the cafeteria. And the director looked at him and said, do you have your student enrollment card? And he said, y yes. He said, well, let me see it. And he gave him the card. And on the front, it had his picture and his name, his address and name and all that kind of stuff. And the director flipped it over on the backside, and he looked, and he saw a code right there. And he looked at the guy, at the young freshman, and he said, uh, son, you see that code right there? That code right there says that when your parents enrolled you in school, that your parents paid for the meal plan. And the meal plan offers you three meals a day in the cafeteria. Your ID is your meal plan, and it's all paid for. Look at your neighbor and say, your ID is your meal plan. And it's all been paid for. In Psalms 23, this same David that we're studying here, it says uh, 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 that when he, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I'll fear no evil for your rod and your staff and comforts me. And then he says, and, and thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies and you anoint my head with oil and my cup runneth over. So what you're hungry for, God has already provided for you and the bill has been paid in full. It's time to recognize that and see the advantage and see the opportunities that Jesus has already paid for. Your joy, your happiness, your life, your privilege, your finances, your health, all of the life that you've had. Jesus has paid the bill and it's open and, 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 and it's an opportunity for us. If we will recognize that that, that we already have that and all we need to do is, is go with God and claim the reward. Look at verse 50. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Shereem road to Gath and to Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. The Philistines ran away so fast, they didn't take their stuff with them. 
So when they came back, they just took an advantage to walk through the enemy's camp and take some stuff out of their tent, anything that they wanted. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. David's carrying the, the head around. Oh, God. This is one of the reasons why, I don't know why this is a children's story that we tell them all the time. But David is walking around with the Philistine's head in his, in, 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 his, in his hands, showing everybody that, look, look, this Goliath, he thought he was going to defy the armies of God. Look at here, what God did. Look at me, man, this head's half as big as I am. Look at what God did. Put it on public display, charge 25 cents, let everybody come around and look at it. The head of giant from Gath. He drags that head everywhere. As a testimony, I'm assuming that this is what God does. Little boy. And he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. In other words, David takes Goliath's sword and his shield and his javelin and his spear and his armor and everything and just puts it in his little old shepherd tent. As Saul watched David going out to the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose, whose son is that young man? And Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. Now, David, Saul was having problems identifying David. But what this says to you is it doesn't matter whether they recognize you or not. Because your advantage doesn't come from the fact that you're recognized by the right people. Your advantage comes from what God puts on the inside of you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, we get caught in this trap, man. Uh, we got to be approved by the right people. We got to been looked at. We got to got. We we got to get with the right crowd. We got to uh, uh, receive approval for, uh, from our friends, and everybody got to got to say okay. We got to be recognized. No, 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 no. You don't have to be recognized by anybody, because the advantage comes from the power that God puts on the inside of you, not from some recognition that somebody else gives you on the outside. And so David gets the giant's head, carries it around, puts it puts it up for display. He'll be carrying it for a long time. You'll see in just a minute. Uh, here is, uh, the king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, uh, Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head. Yeah, he's still, he's still holding that head. Nobody's going to take that head away from him. And he comes to Saul with the head, with the head. And, and, and the problem, just to be truthful about it, the, the problem here is not that Saul doesn't recognize David. David's been playing the harp, playing him to sleep every night. He just, he do, he just has forgotten who's David, who David's daddy is. He said, who, what, what, that boy's daddy? You know, and of course he's going to tell him, but the point is that you don't have to wait for that. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked, and David said, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. So truth number three then becomes it's a sin to simply survive what God's called you to conquer. Are you guys okay? Do we need to quit? Okay, I'll try to get on through real quick. It, it, it's a sin to simply survive something that God has called you to conquer. I'll show you what I mean. Why did David cut off Goliath's head? That seems barbaric, doesn't it? I mean, that, that's a little over the top. Uh, he's lying there. He's got a rock sunk into his forehead. He's dead. And you're going to get his sword, and you're going to take that sword, and you're going to cut that head off. Uh, brutal, brutal, barbaric. Uh, well, it was a custom of the day. And the custom of the day was to show that your enemy was totally defeated. That there was no way this enemy was going to come back. That it was a total, I mean, you are separating his head from his body in total victory. That's the message that David wanted to share. And to cut, I have cut Goliath off completely and he is totally defeated. And here's why I'm focusing on this. Because it seems to me that the Israelites seem to be satisfied with simply surviving. I mean, for 40 days, Goliath has come out there and challenged the armies, 
and said, you bunch of cowards, come by this, send somebody down here to fight with me if you will. You little livered chickens, you, uh, you call yourself the army of God, you're a bunch of cowards, that's what you are. And those guys stood up there and listened to that for 39 days before David came down there and said, and he was the only one that said, hey, pfft, what's this deal about? So what I'm saying and what I'm seeing is that these Israelites, Israelites seem satisfied to simply survive day after day. All they wanted, it seems, all they wanted was not to be killed at the hands of Goliath. So none of them went off the hill. They just stood there and listened to that stuff because they said, well, if I can make it another day and not die at the hands of Goliath, that'll be enough for me. But here comes David, and you remember what I said about passion. Passion always moves things forward. Passion, you have to be filled with passion to accomplish the things of God. Here comes a little guy with passion, and David said, David's not satisfied with just knocking Goliath down. He took Goliath's sword, cut Goliath's head off, and, 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 and declared total victory and went on a uh, carry the Philistines head tour around the whole Holy Land, it looks like. I'm sure that some of you are ahead of me by now in, in what I'm about to say to you about this. But what this says to us is don't be satisfied with fire insurance. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean because some of you haven't been in church all your life and you don't know what I'm even talking about. Some people come to the Lord simply to avoid going to hell. That's their only motive. Their motive is, I don't want to go to hell when I die, and so I better come down to the church and, and, and sign the card or do whatever I want to. And, and, and we, in the church a long time, we talk about those are people that are just looking for fire insurance. Well, what this is saying to us is that we can't be satisfied with fire insurance. We can't be satisfied that we're just saved and going to heaven when we die. That's not good enough because there are a bunch of Goliaths out there that, that, that need to be knocked down. And, and it's not good enough for us just to knock, to knock them down and just stand there and overlook them. There's a process of salvation that God works in every one of our lives, guys. I mean, God did not, in, did not save us for us to spend the rest of our life uh, waiting to die so that we won't go to hell when we die. No, God saved us for a purpose. And, there, and in salvation, there are three tenses. And I don't want to bore you with this, but, but there is justification, which is the past tense, which means I have been justified. Uh, I, I, God, I, God has covered me with his blood and my sins have been covered just as if I'd never sinned. The past tense of salvation is justification. The present tense of salvation. God is actively saving me now. He is setting me aside. He is moving in my life. He is marching me forward. He is teaching me things. He is creating things in me. It's a process called sanctification. I have been sanctified. I'm in the process of being sanctified. Every day I live, I'm in the process of becoming more like Christ every day. The obstacles that come against me, the enemies that fight me, what are they there for so that I can become more like Jesus every day from the time I trust him until the time I reach the third tense of salvation, which is the future tense, which is glorification. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved one day when I go to heaven when I die. And so I'm just saying to you that it's not good enough to just simply sit by and, 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 and watch the enemies of God conquer in this world, waiting that, so that you can go to heaven when you die. David cut the head off of the Goliath to, to have total victory. He didn't just stand there and look at him and say, whoa, that was a big battle. No, he cut his head. And, 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 and what is said about David could be magnified a thousand times about Jesus. I mean, Jesus conquered death and killed death and cut death's head off, not so that death wouldn't bother you anymore, but so that you could live and reign in this life. That's what God's message is for us. Jesus didn't, just didn't die to deliver us. He died that we might have life and have a bunch of it. And so he cut the head off, and sin has no more power in our life. Uh, say, finish the job.
finish the job. Here's truth number four. All right, David went into the battle without a sword, and he left the battle with a sword, right? He didn't have a sword when he went in, and he did have one when he went out. Because he took what was coming at him. Now listen, I know you're tired and you don't want to listen right now. It's bad that the, the best points are at the end. But David didn't have a sword going in. He left with a sword because David took what was coming against him to destroy him and, and used it to deliver himself. Truth, here it is. The very thing that was meant to destroy you might be the thing God uses to deliver you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The very thing that, that the enemy thinks is going to kill you is the very thing God is using to make you strong. Uh, he'll turn it around. He'll, 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 he'll turn things to your favor is what I'm saying. Lawrence says the phrase all the time, this ain't nothing but some bread. What does that mean? That means God turns things around. That means God changes things to our favor. Uh, I, I, I looked at verse 54 a while ago, and I made a little bit about it, about how David uh, uh, took the, the giant's uh, stuff and, and took his armor off, took his sword, took his shield, and took it down to his own little shepherd tent and put it in there. And whenever I, whenever I was talking about Israel coming and plundering the enemy's camp, if you've been in church very long, very many years, you probably, a little praise song probably popped in your mind, didn't it? If you've been there very long, what about the little praise song? I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole to me from me. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. The devil is under my feet. Yeah, I went to the enemy's camp. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, Jesus didn't save you just to go to heaven when you die. He saved you so that, 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 that you could finish the job. You could take back the territory that the enemy has taken from you. What has he taken from you? Your joy, your peace, your prosperity, uh, your life, your marriage, your future, your kids, your grand. What has the enemy stolen from you? Malfunctions, dysfunctions, uh, all kinds of issues in life. The enemy wants to rob you of everything God gave to you. And what this passage is saying and what David's story is saying is don't let him get by with it. Go and cut his head off. I mean, finish the job. Today's attacks might just become tomorrow's advantage for your life. The thing looks like that, that it's going to take you out today may, may be the very thing that God uses to sustain you tomorrow. But you got to finish the job. You can't just sit there and say, mm, yeah. man, you got to get some passion. Cut that head off. Jesus cut, the, Jesus cut death's head off. He didn't just put death in a little hole. And he cut the head off so that you could have complete victory, so that every area of darkness could be taken from your life, so that sin would have no bondage on you. So finish the job. Here's the, here, let, let me give you this, these two verses and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you the last one real quick. All right, fast forward 14 years later. 14 years later. David is on the run. Saul's trying to kill him. David's doing his job too good. The women are singing about David. The women are saying, Saul is slain his thousands, but David is slain his tens of thousands. And they're, they're loving David. And Saul, the old green-eyed monster of jealousy, jumped on him. He wants to kill David. And he's trying to kill David. And David is running from him because David doesn't want to kill God's anointed. David could kill Saul in a heartbeat. David, Saul went in a cave, and David was in there, and his men were in there, and David cut a piece of his robe off, and then and Saul didn't even know it. 
And then he met with Saul, and Saul was wanting to get his men to kill him, and David just held that robe up and said, I could have killed you in that cave. And Saul said, well, you've been better to me than I've been to you, so I'm going to just, this, this is the end of the battle right here. That's how it ended. That's how it ended. But David was running from Saul because he was trying to keep from killing God's anointed king. And, 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 he, and, he, and, and one time he, he left so quickly from someplace that he, he didn't have time to get his weapons. And he got to a, a, a temple just north of Jerusalem uh, uh, called, on a little place called Nob. And Nob means high place. And there was a temple there, and Ahimelech was the high priest. And so David goes into the temple, and he tells Ahimelech, he says, there are two things I need. Number one, I need some bread from my men, and don't say beer for my horses either. Cause <laughs> I need some bread for my men. And I need some weapons. And Ahimelech says, well, David, I don't have any regular bread here. All I have is this consecrated bread. This bread that's been, that's been consecrated to the holiness of God. And I'm not supposed to give this to anybody. Only the priests get to eat this consecrated bread but that's all I got. And then, the, and then Abimelech says, what, what can we do? What can we do? And then he said, hey, the last three days, have any of your men been sinning really bad? He said, have they been with women? That's what he asked them. They've been with women? He said, no. David said, no, I swear to you, they have not been with women. Now, you know why? Because they've been running for their life the last three days. They've been drinking. They've been, they've been crowded. No, they had, and, David, and, and Abimelech says, well, I guess that's good enough. They're holy enough. And so he gave them the consecrated bread, which shows you that God will break the rules for you. Uh, I mean, that's really, isn't grace, wasn't grace breaking the rules? I mean, the rules were you keep these 10 or you die. God said, nah, they'll never keep it. And so God just broke his own rule and sent Christ and the blood of Christ covers our sin now in spite of the fact that we sin all the time. So God, so, so Abimelech gave the guys the bread and then David said, well, uh, I, I need a sword or, or a spear or something. You got, you got some weapons? And, and Abimelech said, uh, Ahimelech, excuse me, said, uh, um, you know, we don't, have, we don't have any weapons here. This is a temple. We don't, we don't have any weapons. And then he said, well, wait a minute. And, it, and David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? Uh, I, well, I, I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. In other words, I had to get on out of there. The priest replied, look, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, who you killed in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. And David said, there's none like it. Give it to me. David is running for his life. He has no weapon and all of a sudden, he gets to the temple and says, give me a sword or a spear at the temple. Who thinks the temple has any kind of a weapon? And Amalek says, we don't have any weapons, but we, you know, years ago, you brought that sword that you killed Goliath with down to the temple, and we set it up behind the ephod. The ephod was the breastplate of the high priest that had the stones that represented Israel and had a black stone, a white stone called a Urim and a Thummim so that when things needed to be decided about God's will, they could cast the black stone or the white stone. You've been blackballed. That's what the Urim and the Thummim was to discern God's will. And it sat in the temple and they set that sword right behind it so every time people came into the temple, they could be reminded of the great victory that God had given his people over the giants in their life. And he said, well, that sword's back there. David said, there's none like it. <laughs> and, you know, give it to me. <laughs> and here's the truth. Your past victories will be waiting for you in your place of future assignments. Oh, yeah. Your past victories, those things that have strengthened you and increased you, they'll, they'll be waiting for you at the place where God assigns you to in the future. David, I'm sure David was thinking, I remember when that sword was aimed at my heart. I remember when everybody laughed and said I had no business fighting a giant. 
I remember when my brother looked at me and laughed at me and told me my heart was wicked and I know you conceited and you got bad motives. And then Saul looked at me and told me that I wasn't able and sat me on the bench and said, you're just a boy, you're on the junior varsity, son. You can't play on the game. And I remember how I triumphed by the word of God. Give that sword to me. I got another enemy out there that I've got to conquer. Give it to me. There is none like it. Faith turns the attack into your advantage. The sword was wrapped in, in, in a cloth behind the ephod. And, and I told you that the ephod was what the high priest used to discern God's will for the nation of Israel. So the ephod represents God's will. And, and when you embrace the will of God to, in your life, the attack becomes an advantage. Have you ever said this or ever heard anybody say this? They had some terrible thing happen in their life. Oh my goodness, two years ago, I just went through hell upside down. It was horrible. I was just, I didn't think I was going to make it. And I cried to God and oh, I almost quit church and quit God. Whoo, it was terrible in my life. Or I had cancer and they could never find it. And man, that chemo and I lost everything. My hair, I was sick as a dog and just, got, I thought I was going to die. Or I had, man, I lost my money. I went bankrupt. I went belly up. They got my house. I got my car. They got my TV. They almost got my wife and kids. And it was a terrible thing I went through. But now it's over. And what do you hear them say? Best thing ever happened in my life. <laughs> I know it was terrible when it was happening, but I'm telling you that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it brought me to Christ. Mm -hmm. Or it made me see myself the way I really am. Or it made me go take some classes and learn how to live in life. Or, or it taught me how to have a, a good family and not destroy the next family God gives me. Because you will find those past weapons, you will find your future weapons at the place where God calls you to. And those things that have almost destroyed you will become the weapons that God uses to create a great life in you. Uh, I mean, let me give you this little tiny story and then I'm quitting. All right. I was preaching a revival in Jasper County, Mississippi, in a little place called Pachuda right near Quitman, Mississippi. I know you know right where it is. <laughs> and I went into that church, and I went into that church. They were having choir practice when I got there. And I went into that church, and I stepped through the front doors, and I was looking at the choir. They were up there practicing. And I looked on the back row where the men always sit in the choir, and lo and behold, there was John. John, and if I said his last name, if people in Meridian were watching, they'd start trembling right now. John, I went to ninth grade with John, eighth and ninth grade. John was the meanest, uh, honorary. I mean, I didn't have any problem with him because I, 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 there was no reason for me to have any conflict with him. But I'm telling you that he was, he was terrifying. He was, I mean, he was just... You knew he was going to be in prison. I mean, you just knew that, that, I mean, you would never see the light of day after he got old enough to get arrested as an adult. I mean, it was terrible. He was bad, mean, tough, troublemaker, fighter. Just, you just didn't mess with him. You just, you just didn't mess with him. And so anyway, there he was in the choir, singing in the choir. And I was captivated by this. I mean, I was just, I couldn't believe it. And after, after church, I didn't have time to talk to him. After the choir just went out and everybody was coming in and then the choir came back in and then we started. So I didn't have time to talk to him before church, but after church, I said, John, 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 wait a minute. He looked just the same. Seriously. He was as big as he was in ninth grade right now. His hair looked just the same. His face looked just the same. Everything looked just the same. And I said, John, John. I said, I got to know, man. What, what in the world happened to you? He said, oh, Brother Keith, he said, uh, when, I got out of, when I got out of junior high, he said, uh, I started working on pulp wood, hauling wood. And, and he said, uh, I got to running, running roads pretty heavy and drinking bad. 
And he said, I got drunk almost every night. And he said, I was over here, and he named a little place on a dirt road. And he said, I was flying up and down that dirt road, just kind of taking those hills like joy bumps. <laughs> and he said, all of a sudden, I pierced out through the woods, slammed into a giant tree. He said, I'm, li I'm lying there on the seat. And he said, blood is going in my eyes. He said, I've got, I'm cut almost all the way down my body. He said, I'm bleeding to death. I'm out in the middle of the woods, in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knows where I am. And he said, I looked up at heaven. Hear what he said. He said, and I said to God, God, if you will save my life, I will serve you forever. And he said, all of a sudden, some lights came through the back window and some, guy, some fellow was driving down the road and saw where the car went off in the woods and come trampling in the woods and found him, got the EMTs out there, saved his life, lost about uh, all, half his blood. I mean, he was terrible. Took him months to get over it and survive. As soon as he said, as soon as I got out of that hospital, he said, I, come, I walked right down here to this church, and I said, Pastor, I want to give my heart to the Lord, and I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve the Lord for the rest of my life. And he said, I want to sing in the choir. I want to do everything, anything you, any, you, just anything you want done, you just tell me, and I'll do it. I don't care what it is. And I thought to myself when I was reading that, that this about David and, and the sword that, that Goliath tried to kill him with, ended up being a weapon that God gave David to protect himself while Saul. That's just too much to bear. And I said, you know, these things that happen in our life are the very things that God uses to give us an advantage as long as we can see it. And I'm going to tell you, the devil lost a good right arm that day when God delivered John, and John said, that's it for me and the devil. I'm going with God. See, you have an advantage if you can see it. Your advantage is that Jesus has already done these things for you and that God is with you and God has promised you and he protects you and he will go with you in spite of how it looks as long as we'll move on with him, forward with him. Can we see our advantage? I, I tell you, there are all kinds of stories you guys have in your life. I know a lot of you guys really very personally. And I could talk about your story. And I could put you up here in David and, and Goliath's place right there. And you would be see it so obvious. But I'm not going to do it because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But anyway, they're there. Think about them. Pray about them. All right. All right. Stand to your feet, would you? Yeah, just stand.